in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Gospel is very straightforward. It centres on the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which is a, quite a straightforward one if you're new to this parable, or if you've heard it many times before, in fact, it gives you the opportunity for studying it at all sorts of levels, because there are hidden depths to it too. So something for everyone. The story begins with a hiring fair at six o'clock in the morning. All who want to be hired gather in the marketplace, and all who are taken on are promised a wage for the day, which is a generous one. More than enough for them to survive, and indeed for their family to survive too. In fact, it's enough for them to thrive. Now, it's not specifically mentioned whether everyone at six o'clock is taken on or not. Um, but we do know that at nine o'clock, a new batch of people arrive for hiring, and they are all taken on as workers in the vineyard. We know that, as I said, the uh, nine o'clockers were all hired and promised a fair wage. The owner goes out at 12 o'clock in the heat of the blistering midday sun and hires others who have turned up. And again, he goes out at three o'clock in the afternoon with only a quarter of the day left and see who's available for hiring then. And he takes all them on. Finally, with just 60 minutes left, goes out at five o'clock and hires everyone who is there and is willing to work. And then at the end of the day, at the time of reckoning, all are paid. But the owner gives the same reward to all. It is his right, he says, to pay whatever he chooses and to whoever he wishes to pay it to. The early risers, of course, grumble a little bit about this. But they shouldn't grumble, he points out, because they get what they agreed to. And indeed, all the workers and their families, no matter what time they arrived, are paid for their work that day, and it enables them to thrive. We have other examples of God caring for people in the Bible. In the Old Testament, of course, we have the Israelites out on their 40 year span of journeying in the desert. First of all, God provided for them for their security so that they were, they were not mown down by the Egyptian charioteers and the army of the Egyptians that were pursuing them. He created dry land for them to walk on through the Red or Reed Sea, and then the waters closed back on their pursuers. But they were, all, were also um, given God's um, provision on a daily basis too. Manna from heaven appeared. Manna was to feed them, to sustain them on their life in the deserts where there was nothing else to eat. The Israelites had never encountered it before. One translation of the word manna means, what is it? Which perhaps shows a little bit of ungratefulness as well. What is it? What is this stuff? But it stopped them from starving for 40 years. What about questions then of justice in the parable? The question of provision is an obvious one. Everyone was given what they needed in order to survive, and for their families to survive and indeed to thrive. But what about the question of justice in the parable? Well, justice too is something that is God-given. But is this parable a story of injustice? Surely the people who worked hardest and for longest during the burning heat of the day deserve more. Well, consider what each was given. The means to fend off starvation, the ability to live on, something given to each irrespective of their situations no matter what they were doing, which prevented them from turning up at the very start of the day, like the six o'clockers. God's provision and care are essentials for life, 
without which we would have no life at all. So before closing, there are a variety of possibilities that we could think about in more depth in our own time. Firstly, we could think about humanity's intrinsic, it seems, ungratefulness. Even though we don't deserve God's constant help, God still provides for us each and every day, whether we deserve it or not. Secondly, we could think about anger and resentment um, of those workers who turned up earlier on in the day, but who still got what was agreed to. It's desperately sad, isn't it? But sometimes you hear of places of worship that are a bit like that, where the people who've been there for very long periods of time, the old guard, who think of themselves as the church, aren't all that nice to people who come in as newcomers. They don't really welcome them, they tolerate them. They don't embrace them and draw them into the centre of church or chapel life. They just allow them to be there on the margins. And that's very sad. And that's why, of course, those communities are doomed to extinction. But whilst that is sad for them, it does mean, of course, that their unpleasantness to newcomers won't actually be transmitted to a, a new generation of people who've, who've actually gone in through the doors of churches or chapels expecting love and being treated badly. That's perhaps the only good thing you can say about that. At least their self-centeredness will die with them. A third thing that we could talk about is why some people only showed up with, say, 60 minutes left on the clock. It would be ever so easy to criticise this lot, wouldn't it? But perhaps um, you can say something good about it, in that they turned up at all. They did turn up, they did do some good work. Although they didn't do it for as long as the others, they still did what the vineyard owner required of them. And we could also say something else as well, which is positive. Now they responded. They responded to a call. And we can say that by analogy, it is the call of the Holy Spirit within certain people that prompts them to say, come to churches or to experience God in a new and a different way. And that response is very important to listen to and to respond to. And we mustn't forget that that is how God deals with people. He brings them into his fold by issuing a call. And we need to respond to that with generosity. They are, after all, fellow heirs of God with us. Although we don't know them very well, they are our future brothers and sisters. As fellow workers in the field, perhaps we ought to learn to be glad then that they turned up at all and that they achieve something for the greater good. Certainly the vineyard owner believed that they deserved rescuing from their plight and gave them what they needed. Clearly they've been off somewhere all day doing who knows what, but they're there now at the end and that's the important thing and they have contributed and of course that means that the vineyard owner can stave off starvation and their needs by giving them what they want out of his grace. So today's parable of the workers in the vineyard tells us once again about God and actually it tells us a little bit about ourselves too. It tells us about God's grace and about his generosity and about his daily provision for our needs. But it also holds up a mirror to ourselves too. It teaches us about the nature of our humanity and that it's a very fragile thing. That we are full of negative as well as positive emotions that can alter the path that we take. And therefore, it calls us to be aware of how we respond. And that makes us better workers 
in the vineyard of God. Workers who will be able to say to someone who has just turned up, friend, come and work here next to me. Amen.